to speak on this verse today because we're in the house of Bhima <laughs> who is described in this verse and actually in the previous verse we have Tathasve Taya Hayai Yukte Mahadhi Syandane Stito Madhava Pandavas Chaiva Divyo Shanko Padat Mahtahu So maybe you know that probably you all know the name of Bhima Prabhu, but his full initiative name is Bhima Madhva. So we have Madhva in the previous verse, and Bhima mentioned by name in this verse. So these names are all very good. Uh, Prabhupada mentions in the purport different names of Krishna, how he is known by different names. And his devotees also have different names. There are many different names for Arjuna. There are many different names for Krishna given in Bhagavad Gita. Many different, several different names given for Arjuna. One of the names is given here, Dhananjaya. And, and uh, for Bhima, this this name is uh, given Brikodara, one who can uh, means he's literally means who's got a stomach like a wolf, so who eats voraciously. So the different names are given, and devotees also are given names of the Lord or names of his devotees to remind us of Krishna and his devotees and their different qualities which are described in their names and traditionally in Indian culture names of the Lord were given to people Hare Krishna so so that uh, even if the, the whole Indian culture was arranged, so that when we say Indian culture means Vedic culture, and particularly Vaishnav culture, was arranged that directly and indirectly one will always be conscious of the Lord. As I mentioned in this book, Glimpses of Traditional Indian Life, I, I had this experience many years ago this, in a village in Bangladesh. There's the, the youngest son in the family where I was staying was named Vishnu so always throughout because the uh, mother is not attached to a young child so throughout the day I'd be hearing I'd call him Vishnu, Vishnu Vishnu, Vishnu Kotayachish, Vishnu so all the time she was thinking of her son but because she had the good sense to call the son the name Vishnu so all the time the name of Vishnu is being heard. So we should chant the names of the Lord, chant the names of his devotees, and hear about them also, because when we hear about the qualities of the Lord and his devotees, then when we hear the name, then naturally Nam, Gun, Rup, Lila, all these different facets of the Lord and his devotees will come in our mind and this is Krishna consciousness because if we think about him that is Krishna consciousness and then naturally when we think of him and his wonderful qualities then actually when we think of the Lord and his wonderful qualities there are two possible reactions to that one is that when we hear of a person of superior qualities then if we are of sanvati of good consciousness then we will submit to such a person and think how I could serve that person that that should be the natural feeling of uh, someone who hears the good qualities of a great person and think, how I should serve this person is superior I should serve that person then the other the durmati if we have a bad consciousness then we'll become envious of that person. So some people on hearing the qualities of the Lord and his devotees, they become envious. And often here we're speaking about Bhima. So usually we find Bhim is characterized in the uh, demoniac Indian cinema posing itself as being religious. Bhim is posed as some kind of foolish person with, who's just some kind of unintelligent, uh, impulsive, bullying kind of person. Similarly, Narad Muni, the great devotee Narad Muni, 
in the Indian cinema is very offensive actually they present him as some kind of like that, some kind of foolish person so our hearing and learning about Krishna is best performed in the parampara system not from TV sometimes people ask that well is it alright that we watch the Krishna series on TV or Mahabharata on TV we could say it's maybe better than watching the Miss World contest on TV <laughs> which is coming up soon I happen to know <laughs> because I you know I saw a sign in, in somewhere Hyderabad or somewhere coming up live on TV maybe it's finished maybe the signs just still there I don't know maybe it, anyway there are so many things you can watch on TV and as you know I generally recommend throw away your TV it can be used also for good purposes but in general uh, it's not very good so this you can watch Mahabharata I watched actually one or two when that first came out when was that about 1980 something that came out there was a big scene of people uh, Ramayan Mahabharata it became very popular but actually I didn't like it very much because the way they the way they portray the actors as being just the, the, they portray the great personality so worshipable by us and they like being they portray as some some blundering fool so this is not proper not very proper it's better not to learn about Krishna from TV which after all it's presented only for some commercial venture even that Sita she was acting the, the part of Sita and then where she was going in India they wanted to uh, treat her like Sita but she didn't want to be treated like Sita because she's a um, TV actress and TV actresses are nothing like Sita at all they're just the opposite so she was I won't use the word because people get upset actually Prabhupada used to use all the time <laughs> in English it begins with P and the second letter is R the third is O and you can guess the rest so uh, actually that's a fact so there char no character volume increase so we why uh, we hear Mahabharata and Ramayana so the, what we should expect from hearing that actually that should lead to Krishna Bhakti but come say come minimum we should expect that anyone who's hearing these literatures at least they should have good character isn't it we would expect that the, from Mahabharata and from Ramayana we learn about Dharma so the, the very basic principle of Dharma is that there should be good character now good character that ultimately means to be a devotee of Krishna but we see that both Mahabharata and Ramayana in simplistic terms it can be understood that the forces of evil against the forces of good and so many complex questions come up especially in Mahabharata how to act in different situations what is dharmic what is adharmic so these personalities they the Bhima, Arjuna, Rishikesh, Krishna these are all worshipable personalities with this Bhagavad Gita we are reading so here it's mentioned Bhima Karma Prakodaraha so Sanjay here is narrated and Vyas in the broader scheme Vyas is narrating so already this statement Bhima Karma Bhima Karma, a performer of great activities. That's already been meant. It's it's it, at this point it doesn't have to be explained for one who's going through the Mahabharata. In Mahabharata we find that 
the, the, in the story of the Pandavas, we find that Bhim, he is, in terms of activities, he is as much or more than the rest of the Pandavas put together. Whenever there is anything to be done, Draupadi goes to Bhim. She wants something done, she goes to him. She knows that if anything, if we, Yudhishthya, he's a philosopher. Arjuna, he's philosopher and action, somewhere in between. With Bhim, if you want anything done, go to Bhim. <laughs> Yudhishthya, of course, he's also a fighter. And Bhim is not that he's just, he also knows, he also knows what is philosophy, what is dharma. But he's a very powerful figure. Bhima Karma. Here it's mentioned. Very wonderful, act, a very extraordinary activity. Extraordinarily strong, extraordinarily powerful. That uh, Kunti Devi, she summarized the sufferings of the Pandavas <coughs> in one verse when she was speaking to Krishna and she pointed, she picked out some of the main difficulties that the Pandavas had been through and if we see if we examine those difficulties you'll find that Bhima is a central figure in all of them Vishal Mahal Purushada Darshanat Asat Sabhaya Vanavasa Krishna Ridheim Ridhe Neka Maharatastrato. Ridheim Ridhe Neka Maharatastrato. Donastrato Chasma Hare Bhakshitaha. She says, In all our difficulties, you, Hari, have Avirakshitaha. You have protected us. But just like Arjuna, Krishna told him, Nimitta Bhatram Bhavasabhya Sachin. You've got two very good, you can shoot with your right hand or your left hand, but actually the ability is coming from me. You be my nimitta mantra, my instrument. So in the same way, Kunti Devi was recognizing that Krishna has protected us in all situations. But practically we see that in all these situations he mentioned, that is Bhim who is the central figure on the stage. She said, the first thing she says, Visham, you protected us from poison. That poison was given to Bhima. Because Duryodhana understood that if I can get Bhima out of the way, then the others, we'll see about them afterwards. But as long as Bhima, he's the main problem. So they tried to poison him, but it didn't work. Krishna was protecting. But they were particularly trying to poison him. And then uh, the great fire, the house was set on, they put in the house, the house was set on fire. So anyway they ran out through the tunnel, but they couldn't have even survived in the jungle if it wasn't a demon. They were so exhausted, he took, they were all exhausted from running and he's still feeling fresh. So he just took them all on his shoulders and he ran with all of them. <laughs> You're exhausted? Well, okay. Jump on my shoulder. <laughs> like that. Just like uh, Hanuman, the same thing in the place of Mahiravana. Ram and Lakshman, who are the supreme personalities of Godhead, appear to be incapable in the presence of Hanuman, and he expanded himself, okay, we're going back up to the Mahi, from the place of Mahiravana. So, uh, then... Uh, in the jungle, so many difficulties. Purushad, Prabhupada mentions in this purport, the Hidim, Rakshas. He thought, oh, here I am living in this jungle. We don't, we don't get the smell of human bodies very often. It's a very sweet smell to me. I'm feeling so hungry and then just by God's grace he was thinking, Rakshas, by good fortune a whole party of healthy people came along. Good fortune for me. No, you don't know, you're dealing with being. You think, usually Rakshasa means it's uh, 
they can just pick up a human being. For them it's no, just like you see this uh, Rakshas, fam famous Ravana. He got benedictions, I won't be killed by the devas, Gandhi. he didn't bother about human being. Why, you know, why should I take a why should I take any benediction not to be killed by a human being? It's like, you know, you don't you don't do some cover to protect me from goldfish or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's not a threat. What can, what can a goldfish do to you? You know what a goldfish is? That's part of Western culture. People keep goldfish in a bowl and they watch them swimming around. So a little fish, it's no this big. There's not a threat. You don't, you don't. People don't pray at night. God, please protect me from goldfish. <laughs> so in the same way, Ravana was thinking, I, I don't need any protection from men. So Rakshas says they don't worry about men. They eat them just like men eat fish. Some, some. Men. <laughs> not you. I was just in Puri, so I was going for a walk every morning, and every morning. Because mostly uh, Bengalis are coming and they're all looking, all the fish are caught, Ooh, look very nice. <laughs> so, dead fish, fresh from the ocean. And they really have to do bhima karma to, ca to catch those fish also. Anyway, that's another story. So uh, the same way the Rakshas is saying, it's not a threat to me, it's my food. So Bhima came and said, he wasn't reckoning Bhim. He thought he'd eat Bhim, but Bhim killed him. Otherwise, the other Pandavas, they would have been in trouble, actually. So, Purushada Darshana, Asat Sabha. That's a big story. Bhim was ready right there to, you know, forget all this 12 years in the jungle. Let's fight right now. You know, I got my arms. What is this? I'm ready to fight, but Krishna... Krishna, no, just wait. Well, he wanted to wait, wait, wait. Twelve years, right? Twelve years. What was going on in Bhima's heart? That anger was just... It didn't decrease. Generally, if you're angry, then... Leave it. If you're feeling angry, just wait sometimes. Wait for it. But with Bhima, no. It was just increasing, 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 all the time. He promised Dushasha that I'm going to... Your heart is so wicked that I'm going to go through the great austerity of ripping it out and drinking that blood. And he promised, he remembered that promise. This is terror. He did that. Eventually he did. He got Dushasha and he ripped his body up and drunk the blood and said, this, this taste to me this is more sweet than the nectar of heaven, this is better than my mother's milk, this is better than milk and honey mix, this is the best thing I ever tasted yeah. every, every, even the Kshatriyas they, the, they were shocked so terrible, it's the very name Bhim means something terrible so in the Asad Sabha he was there then Vanavas, Krishna, very difficult, so many difficulties they went through. Bhima, so many wonderful things he did. Of course, there were all the Pandavas were there, especially Yudhishthira and Arjuna and Bhima, these three. And the, the two twins, the, the, or the younger, they're also there. But especially we are Yudhishthira, Arjuna and Bhima. Anyway, today we're concentrating on Bhima. So, Bhima, he is the, uh, others are mentioned here for their, what they do, Rishikesh, he controls the senses. Dhananja, he performed the great feat of bringing wealth. And Vikrodhara performs tremendously powerful activities. And also, his name is given that he's also noted for eating tremendously. So sometimes when you mention that people think, well, that's glutton, something like that. 
being glutton. So I read that somewhere some rascal had written, he's a glutton. But no, it's mentioned Bhima Karma Vikrodara. He performs tremendous activities and he eats a tremendous amount. So he eats according to his need. It's not that he's a glutton. Prabhupada said that if you want, you you eat. You eat. No, no problem. You eat large amounts. What do you want? You eat as much. But then you should, if you want to eat like Bhim, you should also perform activities. Because <laughs> both things are there, not just one. So eat according to your requirement. Bhima's requirement is he performs trem- tremendous physical activity. So he eats tremendously. Whatever the Pandavas would get, Bhim would take first. And he would eat the major portion and then a little bit would be left over and the Pandavas would share it between themselves. So if you want, you can do like that also. But then you should perform such activities. Otherwise, generally a Vaishnava is called a mitabhuk. He's re- restrained in his eating. So we can say, Bhim, how is he re- Yes, he's also restrained. How is he restrained? Because he eats what he needs to perform his service to Krishna. So sometimes we become surprised when we hear about, you know, what kind of person is this? He seems like a, like a very, almost like a gross kind of figure. But we should be very careful in our judgment. There are many Vaishnavas who, it may appear, if we judge by our so-called rascal objective intelligence, then we'll misunderstand. This is the, in the modern age, you're supposed to have objective intelligence. Objective. But this is not the proper way to understand. Objective intelligence really means that I think I am the object and I should judge according to what I think. But our real objective intelligence means that we should understand Krishna. He is the object. He is the center. I am, it's not that I should judge with my intelligence, but we should understand as Krishna understands. Otherwise we're going to misunderstand. What is our objective intelligence? means that my intelligence is directed to, misun- to forget Krishna. And on that platform I consider what is right, what is wrong, what is morality, what is immorality. But it must be wrong. That's why sometimes this word dharma, we're talking about Mahabharata, Ramayana, these are books of dharma. So sometimes people try to translate dharma, but there's no word in English because there's no such concept as dharma. Sometimes they translate. There's no concept because the culture is not... The, the Western culture is not based on trying to find Krishna. The Western culture is based on how to forget Krishna. And even if you say, well, originally the roots were Christian, but Christianity, after all, it's it's not a very uh, advanced concept. The concept of dharma is... In dharma, we have to speak many hours on that also. Now I'm just skimming over. But sometimes dharma that is translated as religion, sometimes that is translated as righteousness. That's a common translation of righteousness, which could correspond to morality. But dharma and morality are not the same thing. We could say that morality is a part of dharma, but that morality is also not this modern idea of morality that you do good so that others be good to others, humanistic morality, that we're all humans and we all live together very nicely. But actually we cannot understand what is moral, what is right, what is wrong, unless we understand what is the desire of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is why dharma actually means to understand what Krishna wants. Morality means to understand what Krishna wants. Righteousness means to do what Krishna wants. And therefore, we find that within the Mahabharata there are various instances in which it seems that Krishna himself is being adharmic. But that is not possible. That it is not possible that Krishna can be adharmic because his very name is dharma.
his dancing with the gopis, that would appear to be adharmic. But it's not. For Krishna to do that, that is the parandharma. For anyone else to even think of doing that, that is param adharma. Actually, even if someone thinks, this is my wife, that is, that is dharma, if one accepts dharma patni. But if one thinks, this is my wife, but doesn't understand that the wife is sahadharmani, meant to perform dharmic activities with me, and that, what is that dharma to serve Krishna? If we think this wife is meant to serve me, that is actually adharma. If we conceive this is my wife without understanding that I am supposed to serve Krishna and my wife is supposed to cooperate with me, actually she is Krishna Dasi. She, uh, she calls me Swami, supposed to, but <laughs> the real Swami is Krishna. So you have no right to be Swami unless you recognize the Param Swami. Just like Guru, he has no right to be a Guru unless he recognizes Krishna. Otherwise you may go on with the formality of Guruji, all this kind of thing. But he's a cheetah unless he directs you to Krishna. So in the same way, if one is a husband and he's accepting the services of the wife, but he doesn't direct her towards Krishna, then this is Adharma. He may follow all the rules of Dharma, according to Dharma Shastra. But, unless Krishna is there in the center, then actually it's Adharma. So all these uh, things are, are there in Mahabharata, Ramayana, to teach us what is Param Dharma, and Bhim, and Arjuna, and of course Krishna, they're the most dharmic personalities because they always do that which is pleasing to Krishna. That is why we should not even, we, we should be very careful, uh, this I am saying, watching this TV program, but if you watch some TV program, even it's showing Mahabharata, but if they show Bhim in some way in which they try to present him in some kind of comic manner, that is Vaishnava Parad. Because everything he does is only for the pleasure of Krishna. And you think, why is he ripping the heart? That's also for the pleasure of Krishna. Krishna is pleased. Yes. He is a demon. He's Dushashana. He's a demon. He's got his rightful punishment. If, if Bhima hadn't done, Krishna would do. Krishna is doing. Sometimes people say, why Krishna? He's killing so many people. They're the lucky ones. <laughs> Otherwise, if you die through the age, everyone's being killed by Krishna. Other, if you die through the agency of Maya, then you just go back to Maya. But if you get killed by Krishna, you go you go to Krishna. At least in the impersonal aspects. At least you at least you get stopped from doing any more nonsense for the time being. So they were saying, then why is Krishna killing? Actually, Krishna is not killing. You are killing yourself by not surrendering to Krishna. You have made the situation in which you are bound to come to this material world and bound to suffer material miseries. Krishna is not killed. There is no death. But you have made a situation where you want to be separate from Krishna. So Krishna is not forcing you. But we have willfully taken to this situation in which we have come to this material world, we have accepted the conditions of this material world because we are envious of Krishna. And because we are envious of Krishna, then we are also envious of Krishna's great devotees, such as Bhim Singh. Now, of course, it may be said that Bhim, he is somewhat unusual. He, if you think of a sadhu, you don't think of someone who rips people's hearts out. So Dhima is a sadhu because he always acts for the pleasure of Krishna. Everything he does is for the pleasure of Krishna. This is the qualification of a sadhu. So generally we think, well, sadhu is very peaceful. And that is also stated in Shastra. That Chitik Shabak Karunika 
सुहृदा सर्वदेहिनम अजात शत्रुव संत साधव साधु भूषण साधु बाय नेचर ही इज वेरी टॉलरेंट वेरी काइंड चितिक्षव करुणिक सुहृदा इज द बेस्ट फ्रेंड टू ऑल लिविंग बीइंग्स हिज एनिमी इज नेवर बोर्न and he's decorated with all the qualities of a saintly person so this is the description of a devotee then we may ask well how does bima fit that description it doesn't seem like that but actually this description fits bima also but he has some unusual service to do who is a very great devotee they may have some unusual service to do just like we find vaishnavanam yatha shambhu at, at least within the material sphere lord shiva is considered the greatest devotee but we find lord shiva is covered with ashes from the crematorium which appears to be ashiva shiva means auspicious and covered with ashes from the crematorium that doesn't appear to be very auspicious and his companions are the bhut prayed all inauspicious people that is his kindness not every devotee can mix with such people if you mix with them then you are you are going to be your consciousness contaminated if we mix with non devotees but his kindness is he gives them some kind of shelter so they can gradually start on the path of purification just like shri laprabad he went to the western countries most people couldn't do that now so many are going the field is prepared but he went he lived with the drunkards in this bowery with the hippies intoxicated no idea of krishna proper purified them not everyone can do that most people they would become contaminated if you go if you go over the seas according to shastra you become contaminated don't go over seas then you become when you go outside you go bahir then you become bahishkrita you go outside then you become thrown out so don't come back because it's under, it's understood if you mix with people of sinful like habits then you also become sinful there's no choice if you go to just that you see if you're going to follow the basic dharma then you have to take food you can only you can only take food which is offered by dharmic personalities if you take food which is given by adharmic people then you become contaminated but if you go to a place where dharma is not being practiced over the sea then you have no choice then you have, you must be contaminated unless you are of the category of shri laprabhat he went there and purified them just like prabhat said in one lecture new york 1966 i am not i am here in new york i am not in new york i am always in vrindavan yatha vaishnav gan shishtan vrindavan wherever there is a vaishnav that place is vrindavan he didn't go to new york he brought vrindavan with him and then he brought the whole world to vrindavan just like gorki shodas babaji maharaj told his disciple bhakti sanjay thakur don't go to kolkata that is kali sthan <laughs> that is the place of kali is kali kali kata kali ghat is still there kali the god is kali and there's kali who's ruling not only kali ghat but the whole of the earth planet the personality of kali raja so where there is meat eating gambling intoxication illicit sex and commercial activities that is a place of kali you know any other place like that <laughs> dubai <laughs> come up where there is gold <laughs> 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 
Maharaj Pariksit drove Kali out of his kingdom. Then he got shot at where there is gold. And kings, they'll have gold. So he came and he got Pariksit Maharaj. By the will of the Lord. Otherwise the devotee is always protected. So, that is, Calcutta, that is a place of Kali. So, uh, Bhaktisthan Sajar Thakur, he went... Actually, he started his main preaching activities in Calcutta after Gorky shot his Prabhupada Mahajala. But he himself in a lecture said, My Guru Maharaj told me not to come to Calcutta. But I never came to Calcutta. You're saying there's an lecture in Calcutta. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I, he said, I never associated with the qualities of Kali. I associate with the devotees here. Want people to move up? Please move up. So special devotees, they may seem to act in a manner which is contrary to dharma, to Vaishnav dharma. They may seem to do just like Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsartaka. Somehow by his grace, by Sh Srila Prabhupada's grace, I've been engaged in writing about him. And he's not what you would think is a sadhu. People think sadhu, very gentle, very nice. So, very gentle and very nice, but in a different way, with a sword. <laughs> with a sword means his tongue. He told himself that the, 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 the only duty of a sadhu is to just like the priest at the sacrifice stands with the sword to cut the neck of the goat. So in the same way a sadhu uses his tongue to cut all the contaminations, all the uh, misunderstandings within the heart, to mercilessly cut. <coughs> so he elaborated on this, the duty of a sadhu to speak in a manner that is painful to others so that the contaminations can be cut out of the heart. Otherwise he said that if a sadhu simply flatters others, so-called sadhu, then he is not your friend, he is your enemy, one who flatters you. Oh yes, you are very nice. Of course a devotee he sees good qualities in others, but it is at the same time it is the duty of a sadhu to point out what is not very nice. So it is an unusual task that as, as Bhaktisthan Sarsar Thakur himself said that if one becomes a guru he ceases to be a Vaishnava. Because a guru is offered respect and a guru is always pointing out the faults in others, supposed to be. And Vaishnava is supposed to be Adosha Darshi. Adosha Darshi. Not to see faults in others. So it appears to be contradictory. But then he said that if a Vaishnava doesn't become a guru, then the disciplic succession cannot continue. So uh, he went on to explain, it's a very wonderful lecture, that actually a Vaishnava never becomes a guru. Just like, he didn't give this example, but he said, just like Bharat, he ruled the kingdom with Rama's padukas there. Now this is, this is, he is, he is ruling. I mean, do this, do that, punish him, don't do that, bring this, bring that. And who are you to say all these things? I'm not saying. These, this is Ram. I'm doing on his behalf. So in the same way, the Guru is not at all like a Vaishnava. Sits on a big seat, talks so many nasty things. But uh, he has to do keeping the shoes of his Guru on his head. This way he can do. So Bhim Singh is unusual killing, fighting, apparently somewhat rough, but he's doing unparalleled service, what others cannot do in the service of Krishna. 
and he comes again to show his compassion for the fallen conditioned souls in another way by coming as Madhva Acharya and very compassionately saving the people of this world from the gobbledygook cooked up by Shankara Acharya that uh, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya Jeevishwara Aikata as the Jiva and Ishwara are these one so he breaks, smashes, cuts wrong theories by his analytical intelligence those who, those who think Bhima not very intelligent they shouldn't say this because he's Madhva who is so intelligent that actually no one could understand what he was saying his intelligence because uh, Brahmins in those days they were very uh, much proud of their intelligence so different theories were break, broken or established or destroyed on the basis of dialectic analysis of Shastra nowadays Brahmins may also be intelligent but they're not using their intelligence to study Shastra unfortunately before the Brahmins were very intelligent but they remained poor also because they were intelligent they didn't want to get caught up <laughs> they didn't want to get caught up in the uh, trappings the the because they were actually intelligent they didn't want to get caught in material life now they're using their intelligence to be you see generally the despite all these reservations system still the Brahmins are coming out on top because it must be they're getting something intelligence is still there but it's being used to become chief ministers of states and heads of corporations and things like this prime minister recent two recent prime ministers so uh, actually this uh, now what was I saying? Bhima is reforming. How did I get onto that? I lost my track. Huh? Yeah, but when, how do we get away? What's the last thing I was saying about Bhima? It's supposed to be talking about Bhima here. Huh? Ah, yes, intelligence, yeah. So, for, the, for those who think he's not intelligent, then they should see he came as Madhva. Of course, you cannot prove that. And that is accepted that he is uh, Madhva he presented all this philosophy very actually because Shankaracharya made his philosophy in a very complicated way and manipulating words and unless you're a Sanskrit pundit you can't understand but his conclusion is all nonsense that everything is all one so Madhva had to go back through all the different arguments and show this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong and come out with the actual position that everything is not all one we are not God actually you don't need in tremendous intelligence to understand all this but because people think they're intelligent and their intelligence got all mixed up it's just like you see in the modern age people so intelligent and they're using their intelligence for just nonsense making silly movies I mean in the western countries it's supposed to be more intelligent but it's all it's just more sophisticated nonsense that's all. I know all the movies I don't see them I never go to see but you know you can't avoid it if you everywhere you see advertisements and, uh, I know all the great movies of the last 20 years <laughs> there, was, there was Jaws and then Batman and then Space Odyssey, some of the Star Wars or something like that. Then dinosaurs and Jurassic Park. Yeah. <laughs> so I know. So I don't need to go to the movies. I know. I know what it's all about. It's uh, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Sometimes in Star Wars. Sometimes in dinosaurs. And, sometimes getting eaten by a shark and 
It's just they, yeah, they just change it a little bit. So, so, so they're using their intelligence for just nonsense. But Madhvacharya was using his intelligence to prove what any intelligent person should understand is that we are not God, we are subservient to God. But people are so stupid for all their intelligence that they're not even, if they're not at all thinking about God, they're thinking about Batman. And if at all they're thinking about God, they're thinking, oh God, yes, yes, I believe in God. I'm God. <laughs> so, they're stupid. So actually Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's system is, is very practical because people are so stupid in the modern age. They can, uh, Madhvacharya is so, uh, so high intelligent level. It's, it's people, they think they're intelligent. But what, they're using their intelligence to make Batman movies. And then people go and watch it. That just goes, out to, just goes to show how stupid people are. I mean, they wouldn't make the movie if they wouldn't make money. And they make the money because people go and watch it. That means everyone's stupid. <laughs> So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu just made it very simple. The, the philosophy, very simple. Just like people will be discussing, is Lord Shiva supreme or Vishnu supreme? And, you know, this way, that way, another way, and this Shastra says this, this Shastra says this, what the... But you can just make it very simple also. Just like you see Ganga, the one the Ganga is going on one's head, and that same Ganga is coming from someone else's feet. So, who's supreme? You don't need big, big argument. The water is coming from his feet, and the other one is taking on the head. So, no need a big discussion. Then, uh, this Shankaracharya, is it all one, this, that, the other? No. Chaitanya Mahabharu immediately pointed out that this Shankaracharya, he made some mistake. He's, he's, to uphold his philosophy, he said that Vyas has made a mistake. We can't accept it. Finish. Throw it out. That's all. Prabhupada also, his preaching system is very simple. When he was at the Harvard University, he was with giving some lecture, and these uh, Indian students came. The, the Western students weren't protesting, the Indian students were protesting. The no, no, Swamiji, Shastra means everything is all one. So Prabhupada was discussing, and then Prabhupada grabbed his shirt like this. That if everything is all one, why don't you just wear some ball of cotton? <laughs> Have you seen the cotton plant? You're all from city. You haven't seen. Have you seen? Who's seen? Cotton plant. Some less than half. That just goes to show. <laughs> of course, it's not grown in all parts of India. But you see, the cotton plant, you get little bits of cotton. And it's completely raw. So you can't wear that. It's cotton. You can't wear it. It has to be processed, spun, and then woven. Then you can wear cotton shirt. Probably, why don't you just wear the cotton ball? <laughs> if it's all one. <laughs> Once one of our devotees in London, he was going shop to shop, selling books. So he came to the shop of an Indian man who was selling, I don't know, antiques, curios, it's a silly thing, people. But if, they, if a chair is 200 years old, then it's worth, you know, $200,000 or something. <laughs> Especially if, you know, Napoleon sat on it or something. Antiques. <laughs> so the man, he was selling books, he said, no, 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 I, everything's all one. Everything's all I, uh, We can't accept this function. He said, well, if everything's all one, then I'm going to take some of these valuable antiques out of the shop. And whether it's in the shop or outside, it's all the same. It's all one. <laughs> I don't have to pay you because whether the money's in my pocket or your pocket, it's all the same. <laughs> so it's easy to defeat these people, actually. 
when it comes down to something practical. So like that, we find the very Prabhupada, how he was preaching, very simple, straightforward, to the same point. And that, if we can do, if we can convince people that you're all talking nonsense, that is really bhima karma. It's so difficult. Uh, knows that beam, at least he would fight, they'd fight and the person would be dead and it's clear, finished. But nowadays you speak with people and they're so stupid that even though they're talking all nonsense and you're, sh you're proving that they're talking nonsense, they still can't understand. Have you had this experience when you meet with people, you try to discuss Krishna conscious philosophy? They'll always, they'll go off on a tangent or something like this. Just like sometime I was talking to someone, I was giving the example of some blind man and lame man. Why are you discriminating against blind men? I'm giving an example, blind man and lame man. No, you shouldn't discriminate against blind people. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with lame people? Why are you against them? You know, it's just, just so, so lacking. I mean, you, you can't even begin to speak to them. Their intelligence is so, so dull. They can't even begin to understand. So then there comes another thing. Chanting Hare Krishna. And if they can't do that, they talk you all nonsense. Blah, 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 blah. Put some prasadam in their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually very difficult preaching Kali Yoga. It's very, very difficult. You are very, very pious people. But it can be very, 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 very difficult. We go among these so-called scientists and people that I don't believe in God, and they, they I don't. But they already made us say I don't believe in God, and because they think that they're so, I I don't believe in God. That means that I don't believe in God. Then how can God exist? Because I don't believe in Him. No rationality, no intelligence. It's very difficult to preach Krishna consciousness in modern language. But we have to try. The best thing, give prasadam, holy name, and give these books. Give these books. These books have their effect. They're very powerful. Very, very powerful. In this book we have Krishna, Arjuna, Bhima, Pandava. They're all there to fight and knock all the stupid ideas in them. All these foolish ideas accumulated for many lifetimes together. If people read this book, their life will change. So, it may be a little difficult in this country, even to get the books. But when you get the books, distribute. And if you want to do something to help your relatives in your country, then give them these books. Best. Try to make them devotees by speaking to them. If they don't come along, at least give them these books. We have a devotee here from Iran, Hare Krishna. We also have Bhagavad Gita as it is for last more than one year, I think. It is maybe two years now. Four years, so much is it in Iranian. Farsi. So... This is very wonderful. Practically, this is this is heroism on the level of view. It's not an easy thing to produce these books, distribute in these countries. So there's heroism still. We can be attracted to the heroism of Mahabharata, but Krishna is giving us an opportunity also. Because we have to see intelligently also how to act, not recklessly. Bhima was a great fighter, one symptom of a great fighter, not reckless. They know how to fight, where to fight, when to fight. They're not afraid to fight, but they do so with intelligence also. So that's a great challenge. If we can bring Krishna consciousness to people of uh, such a different culture. 
it's a great challenge to bring anyone to Krishna consciousness, but bringing people from different cultures, that's a great work. So see what you can do. We have a very great mission. Krishna is on the battlefield. Very big task. For Krishna is easy. But the, the core of our army was so great. How to overcome? Only by Krishna's grace. Jayatang Panduputranam Yatra Pakshe Janadana. The Pandavas must be victorious because Janadan, Krishna, is on their side. So you have very, very great work to do, preaching Krishna consciousness all over the world. How can we do it? This whole materialistic civilization is so strong. Frankly, every year that goes past, in India it seems like 20 years, the, the, the forces of Maya are making 20 years progress or regress. It's so strong, so bad situation that uh, India's so much, so becoming so horribly materialistic and sinful and westernized and already for many years, cow slaughter, abortion, two of the most sinful things, which is normal. And now everything, all the bad things are becoming just normal, especially this this lusty atmosphere in India is so strong and there's no question of spiritual life in a lusty atmosphere. Very lusty. So much sex, sex, sex. It's just everywhere. So how to preach Krishna consciousness with this demoniac mood becoming more and more and more strong? We have to take shelter of Krishna. We have to, just like Bhim, working hard under the shelter of Krishna. We can take inspiration from Bhim, Arjun, Yudhishthir. How they were in the most difficult situation, but they kept faith in Krishna. They didn't want the kingdom for, for themselves. They wanted it so that they could perform their service to Krishna. It wasn't that they were selfish. So we should preach Krishna Krishna and try very hard. Bring more and more people to Krishna. Not for our own aggrandizement, but because we want to please Krishna. Krishna will be pleased. So you think, how is it possible to bring people to Krishna? By His grace. Not by, we should try, just like Bhim, he didn't just think, well, you know, Krishna's here, so nothing for me to do. Yeah, everything for you to do. Remembering Krishna. So let us do, try, see what we can do, try to spread Krishna consciousness to the best of our ability. Praying to Krishna, Krishna, please help me. It's a very difficult task. We can be successful by Krishna's grace, despite this demoniac society. One time Prabhupada was asked, devotees asked Prabhupada, oh, Prabhupada, it seems, we're supposed to preach Krishna consciousness, it seems so difficult, it's a very demoniac society. How can we overcome this demoniac influence. Prabhupada said that one little kick from Krishna and the whole demoniac society can be finished. <laughs> <laughs> that is the fact. Of course, little kick from Krishna. Is it little? What is little for Krishna? One little step for Krishna covers half the universe. Bhamandi. And the other half covered the rest of the universe. So we should pray to Krishna just like Bali Ram Maharaj. Please put your step on my head. Then everything is possible. So let us remember the uh, personality of Bhim, who is always connected to Madhava, who is a great worshipable personality, who performed wonderful activities in the service of the Lord. And within our capacity, we should also try to perform. Try to do something wonderful for Krishna. Prabhupada used to say that often. He often used to say to most of his disciples were American. They used to say, what is the use of your being American if you cannot do something wonderful for Krishna? As American, you think they're going to do something big, whatever they do. <laughs> they, build a, they build a huge building, 
then they, they come into uh, Iraq and, you know, we don't like you, Mr. Hussein, Saddam. So, uh, you know, we're here, you're gone. <laughs> so, Robert is saying, there's no use. You're, you're American, so, you know, you, you just can't sit and chant Hare Krishna. That's not fitting. You should do something. So, you're not American, thank God. <laughs> you're more lucky. You're Indian. So what is the use of your being Indian? <laughs> Higher birth. You should do more for Krishna. Isn't it? Bharata Bhumitai Hoila Manusha Janma Jam Janma Shata Kari Koro Para Upaka. So you all know that verse. Those who are fortunate enough to take birth in the land of Bhara as a human being, they should make their life successful and do welfare activities for others by spreading Krishna consciousness. So actually it's a good time for spreading Krishna consciousness in India because people are so frustrated. In the Western countries it took them about a hundred years of the technological age to realize this is miserable. And still they're trying to enjoy it. But actually everyone knows life is miserable. But in India it took maybe a, already people a very short time. It means more pious. Already people in India understand. Oh, at least some people, those who are more intelligent, they're understanding actually this is it's miserable. They're just working and working and working and working and working. <laughs> They say enjoy, but there's no time to enjoy. <laughs> and then even when you get time, you know, what is the enjoyment anyway? So, so many people, they're ready to take up the real enjoyment of chanting Hare Krishna, dancing, taking Krishna Prasad. People are appreciating this Krishna conscious movement. Appreciating so much. Very simple thing. We don't have to... Krishna consciousness is so simple, we don't need any grand arrangements. Simply just chanting Hare Krishna, people are appreciating so much. Just Sunday evening we had such a one, a, a really one of the best Harinam Sankirtan parades I've ever been on. I've been on many in Hyderabad. So hot. They, they were saying it, that day was 43.9. But that's only what they say. But actually in the city it's more, with all the buildings and the heat radiated, so hot. And in the evening we went out, I don't know if you know Hyderabad, on the, uh, they have that uh, lake. So so many people, yeah. The, uh, that saga they call it. Hussein saga. So people came, so many people came out in the evening and trying to get some relief from the heat just by the side of it. So we had a beautiful Harinam, about 200 devotees with nice banners all lit up. Very, all the devotees were very ecstatic and people were just feeling just, you know, just harassed by the heat and the, the hot cooling sounds of the holy name came and soothed their hearts. It was very, very beautiful, beautiful experience. So when you go back, whenever you go back, you just call, catch a few divine, go, go and hurry now. Go out, do this, distribute Prabhupada's books. People will appreciate it so much. This is our Bhima Karma. This is the great activity we can do. It's stated in Shastra that, that the demigods in heaven, they are wanting to take birth in Bharat Varsha, in this Kali Yuga, so they can take part in the Sankirtan movement. It's right there in Srimad Bhagavatam. So you're so fortunate. You're the fortunate ones. They're the unfortunate ones. They're supposed to be on the Pandava side, but somehow they went on the Kaurava side. <laughs> means in India people are supposed to be pious, but somehow they're becoming impious. So you have to remind them that actually you're supposed to be worshipping Krishna. You're not supposed to be worshipping Mick Jagger. Who really, you know, heard of Mick Jagger? 
He recently came to Bombay. What a great misfortune. Actually, he did some service for Krishna once. He donated something in the, for the first temple in London. So, anyway, I don't say too many bad things about him. His character speaks for itself. But, uh, yeah, people are worshipping people who are not worthy of worship. Krishna is worthy of worship. Bhim, he is worthy of worship because he knows who should be worshipped, Krishna. So you have to remind, actually all the Indian people are meant to worship Krishna. So you have to remind them. So do this work. Just you distribute these Bhagavad Gita's. By Krishna's grace, you're getting some money. So why don't you invest that? Prabhupada said, if you get money, print books. So print books, give people Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita's. These books, Science of Self-Realization, so many books. Give them these books. That will be great service. Very great service. Bhima is famous for his great activities. So great activity, give people Prabhupada's books. That's what Prabhupada said. Prabhupada is close to Krishna, just like the Pandavas, they're so close to Krishna. So Prabhupada is very close to Krishna. He knows what Krishna wants. And he was always emphasizing, distribute these books, distribute these books, distribute these books. So try to do that. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Another thing you have to do is get up in the morning and chant Hare Krishna. So it's getting a little late and some are leaving. Please don't leave without prasadam. In fact, I could just do a little prasadam now because some may want to leave. Unless we do that, you'll, see, you'll find uh, even some people may be chanting Hare Krishna, but they're not... They may even be initiated devotees, but they're not actually... They haven't actually accepted bhakti in their hearts. And I'll tell you, what is the sign of this? They'll chant Hare Krishna. They may follow the four regs, more or less. Usually this, they're not very fixed. Those who are not very fixed, they're not very fixed in following the regulations. But they will like to listen to some entertainment style speaker. They don't differentiate between actual speakers of Krishna consciousness and those who speak as a kind of semi-religious entertainment. Who are not actually speaking Bhagavad Gita as it is. It's a kind of pious entertainment. They, they like to just tell some stories and make people laugh. It may be stories from Krishna, but they'll, they'll mix up their own jokes with it. You know these professional speakers. Or they'll say, oh, don't blaspheme such and such. He's a great devotee. They don't have a clear conception of what is Krishna consciousness. So certainly at some point we have to make it very clear that the path given by the pure Vaishnava Acharyas, this is correct. Everything else, even it may appear to be like Krishna Bhakti, it is mixed up with desires for personal sense gratification and uh, that has to be separated. The, the, the Mayavadis posing as devotees, the uh, entertainers posing as devotees, they should understand this is not correct. Otherwise, you see, even just like singing Hare Krishna, there's so many people who sing Hare Krishna, but it's more to show off their voice than to praise Krishna. The style, how they're, how they're singing, and that becomes more than the actual feeling of how we're praying to Krishna. And then uh, there's certain kind of devotees who they, they like this kind of kid because it's for their sense gratification. People go to bhajan performances and they clap. Once the clapping starts, you know the bhakti is finished. Because if clapping means you're thinking this is something for my sense gratification, I enjoyed it. And I'm reciprocating with the performer. Yes, you did very nicely. But no. Sankirtan means we all join in together to praise the Lord. And we try to do nicely. But it's, we try to sing nicely, but the emphasis is not on how I'm performing. 
The emphasis is on how we are pleasing Krishna. So, generally, people who don't understand Krishna consciousness as it is will take it as another kind of their own entertainment for my pleasure. They cannot actually understand what is Krishna consciousness and they will protest that no, no, you shouldn't be very, you shouldn't be fanatical. It's all, everyone's a great, they're, they're, someone who's a great entertainer, they'll call great devotee. Someone who's, they like to be cheated. So we should make it clear. Otherwise, uh, you, what's the use? What's the use of spreading a, a pseudo dharma all over the world? Dharma kaitava atra, projita, dharma projita. In like a needle and out like a plow. Yeah, we take an opportunity to preach, you take it. You have to see different circumstances. Not that you go in like a needle and remain forever. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Which often happens. Of course, you may say that not come in like a plow and spoil everything. In the f but in like a needle doesn't mean to compromise. That means ju just like uh, in the beginning we may give in smaller doses, that's all. It doesn't mean compromising. And generally, in, uh, you see, in, so that we, we can speak the truth, and if people are sincere, they'll take it. Any, uh, any sincere person will appreciate that material life is miserable. That the whole of this whole modern society especially is simply cheating and spoiling our spiritual opportunity. I mean, you have to start somewhere. Preaching means you have to start somewhere. Of course, you can start off by saying, well, you chant Hare Krishna and then your family situation will become nice and this and that. It might not, then what will you do? <laughs> because, because, the holy name is not our servant. We are servants of the holy name. So if we start off on a compromised footing, then we might, it becomes difficult to adjust. And people who come in on a compromised basis, if you change it later, then they may just go away also. Because they came for the wrong reason. So you, you I mean, you don't have to go in every time, like full guns blazing, or at least some guns blazing. And it'll actually say, it, it, you'll find more sincere people will come, and you'll find also it'll save you a lot of problems of trying, if, if you're trying to bring people along on a kind of half preaching to them and half not, and then you're playing all these games with them and trying to adjust them, and they're, they're trying to still remain in their materialistic way of thinking and you're trying to bring them around and they're trying to keep in their way. It's just a big headache. There are plenty of sincere people in the world. If you speak the truth, sincere people will be appreciate they'll appreciate it and they'll come. If you speak all nonsense, then all nonsense people will come. And you'll have to suffer. So anyway, there are different ways of preaching, different approaches, but You can't, I mean, you can't avoid, Christ, if you're going to preach Krishna consciousness, you can't avoid Krishna consciousness. You see, if we're going to, if people are going to become Krishna conscious, then they have to read Bhagavad Gita as it is. So, it's pretty heavy. If you're going to take Bhagavad Gita as it is, then, 
then uh, all this concept of demigod worship and uh, thinking oneself one with the Supreme. In Bhagavad Gita, as it is, kicks out. Krishna himself is so strong. And then Prabhupada, just in case you didn't understand it, Prabhupada makes it very clear in the purports. Namang Dushkushino Murha Prabhadyante Naradamaha Maya Paritagyana Asuram Bhavamasha It's pretty strong. It's very strong. It's very clear. It's very direct. But in case we didn't understand, Prabhupada gives a long purport to make it very clear that anyone who doesn't surrender to Krishna is simply a rascal. <laughs> so, it's there. Definitely, we can preach to people, yes, you please take to Krishna Krishna, it's very beautiful, it's very nice, you'll become happy, you'll become peaceful. We can say that, we should say that. But, if we don't differentiate that happiness, peacefulness, beauty, niceness from material happiness, peacefulness, beauty and niceness, then uh, people won't understand what Krishna consciousness is. We have to differentiate. It's about Madhva. His whole point was to differentiate. There are differences. It's not all the same. So Krishna consciousness is very beautiful. It's very nice. It's very sweet. But it's got nothing to do with the niceness, beauty or sweetness of this material world, which is not at all nice or beautiful or sweet or... This material world, the so-called niceness, is all horrible. It's disgusting. 